Treatise of Sexual Alchemy by Samuel on Veor. Part 1. Chapter 1. The Seven Loaves of Bread. The overseer of the house of the overseer of the seal, Noo, triumphant, saith. That which is an abomination unto me, that which is an abomination unto me, let me not eat. That which is an abomination unto me, that which is an abomination unto me is filth, let me not eat it in the place of the sepulchral cakes, which are offered unto the cass. Let it not light upon my body, let me not be obliged to take it into my hands, and let me not be obliged to walk thereon in my sandals. What, now, wilt thou live upon the presence of the gods? Let food come unto me from the place whither thou wilt bring food. And let me live upon the seven loaves of bread which shall he brought as food before horns, and upon the bread which is brought before Thoth. The gods shall say unto me, What manner of food wouldst thou have given unto thee? And I reply, Let Ru eat my food under the sycamore tree of my lady, the goddess Hathor, and let my times he among the divine beings who have alighted thereon. Let Ru have the power to order my own fields in Tatamendes and my own growing crops in Anno Heliopolis. Let me live upon bread made of white barley, and let my beer be made with red grain, and may the persons of my father and mother he given unto me as guardians of my door and for the ordering of my territory. Let me he sound and strong. Let me have a large room and let me he able to sit wheresoever I please. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 52 my brother, you must not eat of filthiness offered to men. The cass are the doubles of the dead. All human beings are pillars of the underworld. All human beings are living dead, eating filthiness from theories, schools, etc. Therefore, brother of mine, nourish yourself with the seven loaves of bread which are brought as food before Horus and eat from the bread which is brought before Thoth. The seven loaves of bread are the wisdom of our seven serpents. We have seven serpents, two groups of three, with the sublime coronation of the seventh tongue of fire that unites ourselves with the One, with the Law, with the Father. These are the seven loaves of bread, which are brought as food before Horus, the child of gold, the intimate Christ of sexual alchemy. Let us eat under the sycamore tree of my lady, the priestess of our alchemical laboratory. The sycamore tree is the sexual forces that we must transmute in our alchemical laboratory. All the sacred books of the world are elaborated with the wisdom of the seven loaves of bread. Let us bow before the Holy Bible and let us make a respectable bow before the Book of the Dead, the Zendavesta, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas. These are eternal books. The wisdom of the prophets is the wisdom of the seven loaves of bread. Let us eat under the sycamore tree of our priestess spouse, in order to elaborate the child of gold of sexual alchemy. Let us eat from the bread, which is brought before Thoth, the bread of the Christ mind, so that we may liberate ourselves from the four bodies of sin and enter the room of the double mot. Chapter 2 Speculum Alchemy The principles of all the metals are salt, mercury, and sulfur. Mercury, sulfur, or salt alone cannot give origin to the metals. However, when united, they give birth to diverse mineral metals. Therefore, it is logical that our philosophical stone must inevitably have these three principles. Sulfur is the fire of alchemy, mercury is the spirit of alchemy, and salt is the mastery of alchemy. In order to elaborate the red elixir and the white elixir, we inevitably need a substance in which salt, sulfur, and mercury are found completely pure and perfect. This is because the impurity and the imperfection of the alloy is again found in the amalgam. However, nothing can be aggregated to the metals except for the substances that are extracted from them. It is logical that a strange substance cannot serve us. Therefore, the crude matter of the great work must be found within ourselves. We perfect the substance, the crude matter, according to the art. This substance is the sacred fire of our organic laboratory. This substance, being semi-solid and semi-liquid, has a pure, clear, white and red mercury and a similar sulfur. Moreover, this substance possesses two types of salt, one fixed and the other volatile. This crude matter of the great work is the semen of our sexual glands. With our science and by means of the fire, we transform this marvelous substance in order for it to be millions of times more perfect at the end of the work. 
We elaborate the red elixir and the white elixir with this marvelous substance. Chapter 3. The Fire. We must work with the matter of our blessed stone, with the goal of perfecting our internal bodies. In the mines, we see how the crude elements are transformed by heat until they are converted into mercury. We see the fire transforming the grease of the earth into sulfur in the mines. The heat acting upon these two principles engenders all the metals of the earth according to their purity or impurity. Nature produces and perfects all the metals of our planet earth by means of incessant baking. Roger Bacon stated the following, Oh, infinite madness, who asked for this, who forced us to want to make the same thing with the help of rare and fantastic procedures? Certainly, beloved brethren, the following phrase of Roger Bacon is very true, nature contains nature. Nature is delighted with nature. Nature dominates nature and it transforms into other natures. Angels are not made with theories of men. Angels are natural, not artificial. Nature contains nature and the blessed stone is our sexual nature with which we can work in our magisterium of fire. It is necessary to bake, bake, and rebake, and to not become tired of it. The fire becomes weak and even extinguished when the alchemist ejaculates the semen. The ancient alchemist stated, let your fire he tranquil and gentle, let it be kept as this each day, always uniform, without being weak. If this is not so, it will cause great damage. The fire becomes weak and even extinguished when the alchemist ejaculates the semen. The alchemist then fails in the great work. Our magisterium is first of all submitted to a gentle and soft fire, but in the work of the great work, it is necessary to intensify the fire, degree by degree, until reaching the goal. Chapter 4. The Furnace and the Receptacle. In Light of Lights, Aristotle states, the mercury must be baked in a triple receptacle of very hard glass. The receptacle must be round with a very small neck. This receptacle is the virile member. The semen is within our sexual organs. It is the crude matter of the great work. The receptacle must be hermetically sealed with one cover, which means it is necessary to cover our sexual organs very well in order to avoid the spilling of the crude matter of the great work. Our glass must be placed in another vessel, hermetically sealed as the first, in such a form that the heat acts upon the crude matter of the great work from above, below, and from all sides. This is the formula, introduce the virile member into the female vagina without ejaculating the semen, without reaching the orgasm. Thus, the phallus, which is the receptacle that contains the crude matter of the great work, remains surrounded by the walls of the vagina and is submitted to heat, equal on every side. Our disciples will now comprehend why Aristotle states in Light of Lights that the mercury must be baked in a triple receptacle of very hard glass. Nature bakes the metals in the mines with the help of the fire, however, it needs receptacles that are adequate for baking. It is noticeable that heat is always constant within the mines. The mountains filled with mines are completely closed in order for the heat not to escape, because without fire the metals of the earth cannot be elaborated. We must do the same with the phallus and the uterus. Both man and woman must withdraw without spilling even a single drop of semen. In the beginning, let your fire be tranquil and gentle, let it be kept as this every day, always uniform, without being weak, otherwise, it will cause great damage. However, brethren, you can intensify the fire, little by little. In the beginning, the practices of sexual magic must be short, but later you can prolong them little by little, making them more intense each time. In order to intensify the fire, need seven times, brother of mine. There are seven serpents that you most raise upon the reed, until the king appears, crowned with the red diadem. The work is analogous to the creation of the human being because, Nature contains nature. Nature is delighted with nature. Nature dominates nature and it transforms into other natures. The furnace of our laboratory is the virile member and the vulva, sexually connected. Chapter 5 The Chapter of Bringing Along a Boat in the Underworld The Overseer of the House of the Overseer of the Seal, New, Triumphant, Seth 
Hail, ye who bring along the boat over the evil back of a peepee grant, that I may bring the boat along, and coil up its ropes in peace, in peace. Come, come, hasten, hasten, for I have come to see my father Osiris, the lord of the ansi garment, who hath gained the mastery with joy of heart. Hail, lord of the rainstorm, thou male, thou sailor. Hall, thou that dost sail over the evil back of a pep. Hail, thou that dost bind up heads and doth establish the bones of the neck, when thou comest forth from the knives. Hail, thou who art in charge of the hidden boat, who dost fetter a pep, grant that I may bring along the boat, and that I may coil up the ropes, and that I may sail forth therein. This land is baleful, and the stars have overbalanced themselves and have fallen upon their faces therein, and they have not found anything which will help them to ascend again, their path is blocked by the tongue of Ra. Antibu is the guide of the two lands. Seb is established through their rudders. The power which openeth the disk. The prince of the red beings. I am brought along like him that hath suffered shipwreck. Grant that my coup, my brother, may come to me, and that I may set out for the place whereof thou knowest. Tell me my name. Set the wood whereat I would anchor. Lord of the two lands who dwellest in the shrine is thy name. Tell me my name. Set the rudder. Leg of Hapiu is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the rope, hair with which Anpu, Anubis, finisheth the work of my embalmment is thy name. Tell us our name, say the Orests, pillars of the underworld is your name. Tell me my name, Seth the hold, Acre is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the mast, he who bringeth back the great lady after she hath gone away is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the lower deck. Standard of Apiute is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the upper post, Throat of Mestha is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the sail, Nut is thy name. Tell us our name, Say the pieces of leather. Ye who are made from the hide of the Nevis bull, Which was burned by Sudi, is your name. Tell us our name, Say the paddles, Fingers of horns the firstborn is your name. Tell me my name, Seth the Machibet, The hand of Isis which wipe away the blood from the eye of horns, is thy name. Tell us our names, say the planks which are in its hulk, Mestha, Happy, Tuamatef, Kebsenef, Hakau, i.e., he who leteth away captive. The maua, he who seizeth by violence, Mine tef, he who seeth what the father bringeth, and Arinef Chisef, i.e., he who made himself. Are your names? Tell us our names, say the bows, he who is at the head of his gnomes. Is your name. Tell me my name, Seth the Hull, Murd is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the Rudder. Akka, true one, is thy name, O thou who shinest from the water, hidden beam is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the Keel, thing, or leg, of Isis, which are a cut off with the knife to bring blood into the sectet boat, is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the Sailor, Traveler is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the wind by which thou art borne along, the north wind which cometh from turn to the nostrils of Kentiamenti is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the river, if thou wouldst travel upon me, those which can be seen is thy name. Tell us our name, say the river ranks, destroyer of the god Oa, he of the spacious hand, in the water house. Is thy name. Tell me my name, Seth the ground, if thou wouldst walk upon me, the nose of heaven which proceedeth from the god Yutu who dwelleth in the Sekitaru, and who cometh forth with rejoicing therefrom, is thy name. Then shall be recited before them these words. Hail to you, O ye divine beings with beautiful casts, ye divine lords of things, who exist and who live forever and whose double period of an illimitable number of years is eternity, I have made a way unto you, grant ye my food and sepulchral meals for my mouth, grant that I may speak therewith and that the goddess Isis give me loaves and cakes in the presence of the great god. I know the great god before whose nostrils ye place celestial food, and his name is Thecum, both when he mocketh his way from the eastern horizon of heaven and when he journeyeth into the western horizon of heaven may his journey he my journey, and his going forth my going forth. Let me not he. Destroyed at the mesquite chamber, and let not the devils gain dominion over my members. I have my cakes in the city of P.E., and I have my ale in the city of Tepu, and let the offerings are given unto you he given unto me this day. 
Let my offerings be wheat and barley. Let my offerings he anti-unguent and linen, garments. Let my offerings he for life, strength, and health. Let my offerings he a coming forth by day in any form whatsoever in which it may please me to appear in Sekitaru. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 99 All of our laboratory work is found enclosed in this chapter of the Book of the Dead, which we have transcribed. First of all, the stone is black, because the alchemist must enter the underworld in order to pull the light away from the darkness. The immaculate whiteness of the light is hidden within the blackness of the stone. This first phase belongs to the state of putrefaction. The stone then reddens, liquefies and thickens before gaining its true whiteness. The stone passes through true alchemical transformations. It blackens, it whitens, it is purified, it is adorned with red and white. It passes innumerable transformations during the entire lichiatic process. It is necessary to bake, bake and rebake until the child of gold appears. This child of gold is the intimate Christ. Except ye he converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Innumerable colors appear in our philosophical stone before it shines. After the whiteness, you cannot deceive yourself, because you will reach a grayish color by increasing the fire. This is the ash. This is the salt of alchemy. The salt is divided into fixed salt and volatile salt. Later, after seven distillations of the vessel, the king appears crowned with the red diadem in. Behold all the initiatic processes that we must perform in our alchemical laboratory. Hail! ye who bring along the boat over the evil hack of a pep. Hail, O warrior, you who bring along the boat of your existence over the evil back of a pep, the tempting serpent of Eden you must pull the light from the darkness in the underworld so that you may reach. Your father Osiris, the innermost, your real being, the lord of the antsy garment. The alchemist must plow the malignant hack of a pep. The tempting serpent of Eden. The alchemist must pull the fire from the evil. The alchemist must pull the immaculate whiteness from the darkness. You must practice sexual magic with your spouse, in order for your black stone to shine with the fire and for it to then become white, immaculate, and pure. It is necessary to bake, bake, and rebake, and to not become tired of it. Thus, we would like to state that it is necessary to intensely practice sexual magic with your spouse, in order to awaken the kundalini and to achieve the union with the innermost. The kundalini rises vertebra by vertebra, canon by canon, degree by degree, little by little. The sacred fire is the sulfur. The ascension of the kundalini is slow and difficult. When the alchemist spills the crude matter of the great work, the fire descends one or more canons, in accordance with the magnitude of the fault. Our Lord, the Christ told me, the disciple must not allow himself to fall, because the disciple who allows himself to fall has then to fight very much in order to recover what has been lost. The tenebrous ones attack you within the darkness in order to impede you from entering the chambers of your spinal column. Each degree that you gain in your spinal column is a cup that you steal from the tenebrous ones of the underworld. You eat the esoteric wisdom of the seven loaves of bread in the chamber of your spinal column. Nourish yourself brother of mine, with the seven loaves of bread, which are brought as food before Horus, and eat of the sepulchral cakes, which are offered unto the Cass. Hail, Lord of the Rainstorm, thou male, thou sailor! Whosoever crosses the initiatic path must live the drama of the cross. The initiate must tolerate the rainstorm of great bitterness. Hail, thou that dost bind up heads and doth establish the hones of the neck when thou comest forth from the knives. We must raise seven serpents upon our reed, until the king appears, crowned with the red diadem. We must pass through the decapitation of John the Baptist seven times. We pass through the decapitation of St. John the Baptist, each time in a very refined form, as the seven serpents pass in successive order from the vertebrae of the neck to the head. Hail, thou that dost bind up heads and doth establish the hones of the neck when thou comest forth from the knives. The naked Salome, drunk with lust and passion and dancing with the head of St. John the Baptist in her lecherous arms before King Herod symbolizes the great human harlot dancing before the world with our earthly head, initiates.
Each time the initiate comes out from the knives, he leaves his vulgar and earthly mind to the world. Hail, thou that dost hind up heads and dost establish the hones or the neck when thou, initiates, comest forth from the knives. It is necessary to hake, bake, and rebake and to not become tired of it. The philosophical stone turns red, turns white, it thickens, it dissolves. It brightens, it sparkles, and it shines within the underworld. Flail, thou who art in charge of the hidden boat, who dost fetter a pep. Grant that I may bring along the boat, and that I may coil up the ropes, and that I may sail forth therein. Hail, warrior, you who victoriously defeats the temptations and steals the cups of your spinal vertebrae from the inhabitants of the underworld. Work in your laboratory until you succeed in reaching your father, Osiris. You are an inhabitant of the underworld, and you must depart from the country of darkness in order to enter the kingdom of the light. It is necessary to bake, bake, and rehake and to not become tired of it. The underworld is terrible. This land is baleful, and the stars have overbalanced themselves and have fallen upon their faces therein, and they have not found anything which will help them to ascend again. Their path is blocked by the tongue of Ra. All human beings are fallen stars in the dark land of the underworld. The road of this dark land is blocked by the tongue of Ra, by the longing for the light, by the path of the initiation that leads us from death to life, from the darkness to the light. Antihu is the guide of the two lands. Antihu is the god of the ban ascension. The ascension of the Lord is performed after our crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Seb is established through their rudders. This means that Atman, the ineffable one, constitutes the kingdom of the gods, thanks to his rudders, the ineffable beings. They are the ones who have departed from the underworld. They have passed from the darkness to the light, because they knew how to extract the whiteness from the black stone, according to the art. These are the princes of the red beings, these are the princes of the fire. These are the masters of metallic transmutations. Grant that my coup, my brother, may come to me and that I may set out for the place whereof thou knowest. This signifies, cover yourself with your brilliant cape, brother of mine, with your translucent cape, and with your spiritual cape, so that you may depart from this dark land, and you may enter into the region of the light. You are a lord of the darkness and a lord of the light. Lord of the two lands who dwellest in the shrine. Leg of Hapiu is thy name, because you are a descendant of the third race. Hair with which Anpu, Anubis, finisheth the work of my embalmment, is thy name. Such is your name, which reminds us that Mary Magdalene embalmed the body of the Master with a precious ointment, before his crucifixion. The holy women embalmed and shrouded the body of Christ after his death. You must be embalmed for death. In each initiation, something dies within ourselves and something is born within ourselves. Your body must be embalmed for death brother of mine. You must be shrouded in the underworld so that you may resurrect from among the dead. It is sad to say, but you are the pillars of the underworld. You are Acre, the lion with two heads, the god of the earth. You are submitted to the lords of karma, to the lions of the law. You now need to be, he who bringeth back the lady after she hath gone away. You need to return to the bosom of the mother goddess of the world. You are called Standard of Apiute, because you are advancing on the path of the initiation, obeying the law. You are called Throat of Mestha, because you have a human's head. You are called Newt, because you came out from the waters of the abyss. You came out from the profound waters of the chaos. The water, semen, must be transmuted into the wine of the light of the alchemist. Ye who are made from the hide of the Nevis bull, which was burned by Sudi. The gods are sons of Neith, the woman. This is why you are made from the hide of the Nevis bull which was burned by Sudi. You are the fingers of Horus, the firstborn, the green child, the child of gold, the intimate Christ who is the result of the work of your blessed stone. Do not forget, brother of mine, that Isis wipes away the blood from the eye of Horus. Our intimate Christ is caressed by the soft hand of the blessed goddess mother of the world. This is how we heal our wounds. The initiation is the painful drama of the cross. You have a human's head. You descend from a divine race. 
You are one of the divine creatures. You have the wings of an eagle, but you have remained captive in this underworld. You have been violently taken by the tenebrous ones of the underworld. Do you see what the parse is bringing? Lie brings you the light. It is necessary to bake, bake, and rebake and to never become tired of it. The one who formed himself is a master of metallic transmutations. You are before your gnomes, the infernal creatures of the underworld, who incessantly attack you. Take very good care of your receptacle so that not even a single drop of your crude matter of the great work escapes. Terrible temptations besiege you in the underworld. The black magicians send you voluptuous temptations, seducing flesh who smile at you in the baleful land, where the stars have overbalanced themselves and have fallen upon their faces. You are the son of Mert. Akka is thy name, O thou who shinest from the water, hidden beam is thy name. The hidden ray is within the water. The terrific fire of the seven serpents that frightfully revolves among terrible flashes of lightning, flashes within the semen. You are a leg of Isis that has been cut by Ra and you must now return to the Goddess Mother, who awaits you in the room of Mott. You are a traveler of the cosmos. Advance, traveler, advance. You are the north wind, which comes from turn. You are the breath of Ra, the father, the eternal Atman. You are those who can be seen. You are a destroyer of the god Oe in the water house, because this water, or crystonic semen of your sexual organs is transformed into fire. Your two Ureus, your two serpents, one from the south and one from the north, shine upon your forehead. These two serpents are two ganglionic cords through which the seminal energy rises to the head the water is transformed into the wine of light, and this sacred wine rises through the two ganglionic cords and shines between the brows. The ancient kings had two crowns upon their head and the sacred serpent between the brows. You are in the held of the reeds, and you must intensely practice sexual magic with your spouse in order to make the fire rise through the reed. We are before the divine beings, the splendid Cass. You must eat sepulchral meals and words of the gods in order to die. However, you will eat sepulchral cakes offered to the gods, but you will not eat theories, religions, schools, etc., because these are abominable. You must eat food and words in order to die and resurrect. Ah! Your death will be sweet, and whosoever witnesses it will feel truly happy. Thy death will have to be the seal of the oath of our eternal love. Death is the crown of everyone. May the goddess Isis give us the loaves of bread in the presence of the great god. May the goddess Isis nourish it with the seven loaves of bread which are brought as food before horns. Let me not he destroyed at the mesket chamber and let not the devil's cane. Dominion over my members. We are reborn as gods within the cradle of skin. This is the underworld. Here, the tempting demons attack us. Here, we must perform the great work. This is why we must extract the hidden and immaculate whiteness when we find the blackness of the stone. When you see the whiteness appearing, you must not forget that the red is hidden within the whiteness. We must extract the red by baking, baking, and rebaking without ever becoming tired of it. The tenebrous ones attack us within the black abysses of the underworlds, and we must courageously pull the fire from them. Later, this fire shines in the spinal column with an immaculate whiteness. After the whiteness, you cannot deceive yourself, because you will reach a grayish color by increasing the fire. The grayish color is the salt of the alchemist. The volatile salt is diffused throughout the entire body, and it passes to the larynx of the woman. The volatile salt of the woman passes to the larynx of the man. This is how our larynx becomes hermaphroditic, and it is converted into a creative organ of the master of metallic transmutations. The fixed salt serves as a base and a foundation. The stone is first of all black, because we must enter the underworld in order to steal the torch of fire from Baphomet. It is then red, because we pull the fire from the spinal chambers. It is then white, because it shines in the candlestick of our spinal column with the splendorous whiteness of the master of metallic transmutations. Then comes the changing phases as we bake, bake and rebake the crude matter of the great work. 
There are seven distillations, which means, there are seven serpents that we must raise upon the reed until the king appears, crowned with the red diadem. In other words, we must raise them until we convert ourselves into masters of the Mahamanvantra. I have my cakes in the city of P.E., and I have my ale in the city of Tepu, and let the offerings which are given unto you be given unto me this day. Let my offerings be wheat and barley, let my offerings be anti unguent and linen garments, let my offerings be for life, strength, and health, let my offerings be a coming forth by day in any form whatsoever in which it may please me to appear in Sekadaru. Our alchemical food is in the city of P.E., which means in Lower Egypt, our sexual organs. The seven loaves of bread, our sacred cakes and our ale are in the city in which Thoth makes the intimate triumph. Thoth is the Christ mind. The god Thoth is the god of the Christ mind. When the human being liberates himself from the four bodies of sin, he is converted into a dragon of the four truths, into a Buddha. When we have performed the great work, we are ineffable gods in the field of the reeds. Chapter 6 The White Elixir and the Red Elixir The White Elixir and the Red Elixir are the tree of the science of good and evil and the tree of life. The Red Elixir is the pure gold of the spirit. It is the tree of life. The White Elixir is the sexual force of Eden. The Red Elixir transforms lead into gold and makes everything yellow. The Red Elixir whitens the metals. It gives them an immaculate whiteness. Although all the metals are carried to perfection by the elixir, there is no doubt that the most perfect metals are those that reach perfection more rapidly. The less perfect metals are reaching perfection in accordance with the more perfect ones. This is the blessed magisterium of the great work of the Father. It is important to learn how to project the red and white elixirs upon the metals in order to transmute them into pure gold. The formula consists of mixing one part of the elixir with the honey of the metal that is closest to perfection. All the contents are enclosed within the receptacle, which is then placed in the furnace in order for the fire to make a perfect union after three days. The same process must be repeated with the other metals that are closest to perfection. Thus, we succeed, little by little, in transmuting all the metals into pure gold. This gold is purer than all the gold of the mines of the earth. The metals are our internal bodies that must be crystified with the white and red elixirs. The first metal that we must transmute into gold is the physical body. We project our white and red elixirs upon this metal in order to transmute it into the pure gold of the spirit. This work is performed when we have raised our first serpent upon the reed. After three days, that is to say, after the first serpent has passed through the three highest chambers of the head, the buddhic body or body of consciousness is integrally fused with the innermost. This is how the closest metal is transformed into pure gold when this integral fusion with the real being is achieved. A new master, who is the result of this fusion, emerges from the living profundity of the consciousness. This internal master is the authentic master of metallic transmutations. Later, the master of metallic transmutations must do the projections upon the remainder of his metals in order to transmute them, by extracting from them the pure gold. It is necessary to bake, bake, and rebake and not to become tired of it. In the beginning, the fire can be low, but later it must be very intense in order to achieve the perfect transmutation. The second metal that must be transmuted is the ethereal body. We perform this work by projecting our white and red elixirs over this body. The spirit and the fire of the second serpent, which are the two elixirs, transmute the ethereal body into to Soma Puchikon, the body of gold. The third metal that we must transmute is the astral body. We perform this work with the third serpent that belongs to the astral body. We extract a superior astral body, which is the intimate Christ, from the astral body. This child of gold is Horus. We then transmute the mental body in order to extract the Christ mind from this metal. Thus, we enter the room of the double mot and we liberate ourselves from the four bodies of sin. When we achieve a perfect metallic transmutation, the four bodies of sin give us the four bodies of gold. 
The four bodies of sin are replaced by four heavenly bodies that serve as a temple for the three-unit immortal spirit. We extract the body of liberation from the physical body. This body is made with flesh, but flesh that does not come from Adam. It is a body filled with millenary imperfections. It is elaborated with the most evolved atoms of our physical body. The body of gold that co-penetrates the body of liberation is extracted from the ethereal body. The child of gold of alchemy that replaces the astral body is extracted from the astral body. The Christ mind that replaces the mental body is extracted from the mental body. This is how we achieve the metallic transmutation. This is how the four bodies of sin are replaced by the four bodies of glory. This is how we transmute the metals with the white and red elixirs. This is how the inferior quaternary reinforces the divine triad. The gods of Nirvana are dressed with four bodies of glory. The gods of Nirvana do not use the four bodies of sin. Only we, masters of Nirvana, who are accomplishing a mission here in the physical world, must keep our four bodies of sin in order to express ourselves through them. However, when we are liberated from the four bodies of sin, we enliven them in the form of hypostasis or by hypostasy. The same eternal and spiritual triad must pass through gigantic alchemical transmutations in order to reach the union with the One, with the Law, with the Father. There are seven serpents that we must raise upon the reed in order to convert ourselves into the king crowned with the red diadem. The fifth serpent gives us Christ will. The sixth serpent gives us Christ consciousness. The seventh serpent unites us with the One, with the Law, with the Father. It is necessary to bake, bake, and rebake and to not become tired of it. The receptacle must be hermetically sealed in order to impede the spilling of the crude matter of the great work. In this work of alchemy, the spiritual substances are converted into corporeal substances and the corporeal substances are converted into spiritual substances. This is our sacred magisterium of the fire. Chapter 7 The Elixir of Long Life the chapter of driving away the slaughterings which are performed in the underworld. Nebsini, the scribe and the designer in the temples of Upper and Lower Egypt, he to whom fair venerations is paid, the son of the scribe and artist Thena, triumphant, saith. Hail, turn, I have become glorious, or a coup, in the presence of the double lion god, the great god, therefore open now unto me the gate of the god Seb. I smell the earth. I bow down so that my nose touch the ground, of the great God who dwelleth in the underworld, and I advance into the presence of the company of the gods who dwell with the beings who are in the underworld. Hail, thou guardian of the divine door of the city of Beta, thou Nedi who dwellest in Amontet. I eat food, and I have life through the air, and the god Atuar leteth me with him to the mighty boat of Kepra. I hold converse with the divine mariners at eventide, I enter in, I go forth, and I see the being who is there, I lift him up, and I say what I have to say unto him whose throat stinks for lack of air. I have life, and I am delivered, having lain down in death. Hail, thou that bringeth offerings and oblations, bring forward thy mouth and make to draw nigh the writings, or lists, of offerings and oblations. Set thou right and truth firmly upon their throne, make thou the writings to draw nigh, and set thou up the goddesses in the presence of Osiris, the mighty God, the prince of everlastingness, who counteth his years, who hearkeneth unto those who are in the islands, or pools, who riseth his right shoulder, who judgeth the divine princes, and who sendeth deceased into the presence of the great sovereign princes who live in the underworld. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 41 When we have achieved glory before the double lion God, which means before the law, the law opens the door of the Divine Seb for us. The Divine Seb is Atman, the universal spirit of life, before whom we bow. Reverently. We then present ourselves before the assembly of the gods who dwell with the beings who are in the underworld. We give thanks to the air, and the Immortal One conduces us towards the mighty boat of Kepra. Kepra is the creative deity of the gods, the sacred scarab, raw within ourselves, the Sadi. I hold converse with the divine mariners at eventide. I enter in, I go forth, and I see the being who is there. This being is my being, my father, who is in secret. 
He is the one whom I converse with when I have perfected myself. This is how I acquired the elixir of long life after having drawn near the writings, or lists, of offerings and oblations. This is how I am delivered and how I have life after having lain down in death. The body of liberation is neither subjected to sickness nor to death. The body of liberation is made with flesh and bones, but it is flesh that does not come from Adam. It is flesh from the cosmic Christ. The body of liberation is similar to the divine rabbi of Galilee. The body of liberation is the body of the gods. We sit upon the throne of justice and truth with this body, and thus we remain exalted as immortals in the presence of Osiris and Horus. Osiris is the innermost, the mighty God, the prince of everlastingness, who counteth his years, who hearkeneth unto those who are in the islands, or pools, who riseth his right shoulder, who judgeth the divine princes, and who sendeth the deceased into the presence of the great sovereign princes who live in the underworld. The entire elixir of long life is found in the phallus of Osiris. We can preserve even the physical body for long eons of time with the elixir of long life. Master Mejner lived seven times seven centuries. The Master Zanoni preserved his physical body for thousands of years. The Count Saint Germain still possesses the same physical body with which he presented himself in the courts of Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries. We enter the kingdom of supermen with the white and red elixirs and we convert ourselves into omnipotent gods of the universe. Chapter 8 The Chapter of Giving Air in the Underworld Seth knew, triumphant. I am the jackal of jackals, I am Shu and I draw air from the presence of the God of Light Ku to the bounds of heaven, and to the bounds of earth, and to the bounds of the uttermost limits of the flight of the Nebe bird. May air be given unto these young divine beings. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 55 The Jackal of Jackals is the chief of the rulers of destiny, Anubis, the god with head of a jackal. Anubis is in charge of the books of the underworld. The Temple of Anubis is the Temple of the Lords of Karma. Each human being has his book of business. Those who learn how to control their ka, astral body, can visit the temple of the jackal of jackals in order to consult their book and to make their negotiations. Whosoever has capital to pay, pays and does well in his negotiations. Whosoever does not have capital to pay, must pay with pain. Perform good deeds so that you may pay your debts. Credits can also be given upon request to the lords of karma. Every credit must be paid. When the logos of the solar system delivered the tunic and mantle of a hierophant of major mysteries to me, he told me, Here, I pay you what I owe you for the practices that you have taught. Whosoever wants light, must give light in order to receive his payment. The jackal of jackals conduces light through all the limits of the firmament and arrives to the frontiers of the Nebe bird, the huge serpent, one of the forty-two judges of Mott in judgment. This great judge is the Logos of the Solar System. The Jackal of Jackals works under the orders of this great judge. These young, divine beings who work with Anubis are the Lords of Karma. The Alchemist must learn how to control his Ka in order to visit the temple of the Jackal of Jackals and to settle his negotiations. In our work with the Blessed Stone, it is indispensable to learn how to consciously handle our negotiations. Chapter 9 the Red Lion The Red Lion is the drinkable gold. The drinkable gold is the Kundalini. The Kundalini is the fire from the semen. It is necessary to separate the Red Lion from all types of waste. These wastes and impurities are separated from the Red Lion by a kneading process. Sexual magic and the strength of willpower is what we understand to be the kneading process. This drinkable gold must be mixed with the alcohol of the wine in order to be washed and then distilled in a very good distiller until the sourness of the royal water completely disappears. The alcohol of the wine is nothing more than the wine of light with which the semen is mixed during the processes of sexual transmutation. This wine of light is transmuted semen. It is necessary to distill, which means to totally transmute the semen. This is how the sourness disappears from the royal water. This is how it is referred to in alchemy. The red lion is the sacred fire. 
it is necessary to place this drinkable gold into a very well-sealed receptacle. It is necessary to bake and rebake three times until the perfect tincture of the sun is obtained. The perfect tincture of the sun gives us the power to resurrect from among the dead. Christ resurrected from the dead on the third day. The perfect tincture of the sun is the kundalini of the astral body. When the initiate conduces his third serpent to the heart, he then passes through the symbolic resurrection and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 10 The Green Lion The Green Lion is the innermost of everyone. This work is performed with the vitriol of Venus. V-I-T-R-I-O-L Visitum interiori terra rectificter invenient occultum lapidum. Visit the interior of the earth, which by rectifying, you will find the occult stone. It is necessary to visit our own interior earth in order to find our blessed stone. This blessed stone is the semen. Vitriol. Liquid glass, flexible and moldable. By rectifying this liquid, we find the tincture of gold, the green lion of alchemy, the innermost. The vitriol has two colors, one red and the other white. The red color reddens everything, it even dyes the white bodies with red. This is the color of passion. The white color whitens everything, it even whitens the red bodies of the abyss. We enter into the world of passion through the erotic doors, in order to steal the cups of the spinal column from the devil. This is how we are stealing the fire from the devil. The tempting demons then attack us in the underworld, and we must fight great battles with them in order to steal the cups of our spinal column. Each cup stolen from the underworld shines with immaculate whiteness in its corresponding vertebra of the medulla. This is how the whiteness of the vitriol whitens all of the red bodies. We must descend to the abyss many times and ascend again, to search for the red and green lions. Carnal passion is the door to enter into the abyss. What is important is to dominate the beast in order to steal the fire from the devil. Hermes Trismegistus states in his Emerald Tablet, separate that spirituous earth from the dense or crude by means of gentle heat, with much attention. In great measure it ascends from the earth up to heaven, and descends again, newborn, on the earth, and the superior and the inferior are increased in power. By this thou wilt partake of the honors of the whole world, and darkness will fly from thee. This is the strength of all powers, with this thou wilt be able to overcome all things, and to transmute all what is fine and what is coarse. In this manner the world was created. The emerald tablet, air and water must be added to the vitriol and it must be purified for one month. The white and red colors will appear when the putrefaction is completed. Concerning this, we would like to state that by practicing sexual magic, the fire of Kundalini awakens after a certain period of time. The awakening of this fire does not present any dangers because it is performed with the direction of a specialist of the invisible world. The red tincture of the vitriol is the fire. Paracelsus states, work with this tincture in a retort and you will see the blackness emerging from it. In alchemy, this retort is our sexual organs. When we are working with the tincture of the green lion, the tenebrous ones of the abyss attack us. This is why we see blackness emerging from the retort. But, in the end we will find the white liquid by distilling in the retort. This white liquid represents all of our esoteric degrees of our spinal column. It is necessary to incessantly rectify our tincture in order to obtain the green lion. This green lion is the natural balsam of all the celestial planets, and it has the power to heal all sicknesses. The green lion is our internal angel, our innermost. Chapter 11. Astral Tinctures. In our work of metallic transmutations, we must elaborate astral tinctures in order to work in the great work. Four parts of metallic water and two parts of soil of red sun. This is the mother tincture of alchemy. Everything must be placed in a receptacle. The contents must solidify and must desegregate three times. This is the mother tincture of alchemy because we elaborate all the seven tinctures of sexual alchemy with this tincture. The metallic water is the semen. 
The soil of the red sun is our sexual organs and the sun sulfur is the kundalini that we must awaken by practicing sexual magic with our spouse. It is clear that it is necessary to solidify it three times, because we are a trio of body, soul, and spirit. We can dye 1,000 ounces with the sun only with one ounce of sun tincture. We can dye the body of mercury with only one ounce of mercury tincture, etc. We can transmute the vital body into a perfect metal with the lunar tincture. We can transmute our buddhic body into a metal of perfection with the tincture of mercury. We can transmute our vehicle of willpower into a body of perfection with the tincture of Venus. We can transmute our astral body or cosmic crestos into a perfect metal with the solar tincture. We can transmute our mental body into a perfect metal with the tincture of Saturn, etc. We transmute the conscious soul of our physical body into a metal of perfection with the tincture of Mars and we give all of our metals the strength of iron. However, the tincture of gold will unite ourselves with the One, with the Law, with the Father. Our seven bodies are influenced by the seven planets. Our seven serpents synthesize all the wisdom of the seven cosmocreators. Each one of our seven bodies must synthesize the perfection of each one of the seven cosmocreators. We must work with our blessed stone in the retort of our sexual laboratory until obtaining the phoenix of the philosophers. This is how we resurrect after having died, just as the phoenix bird of philosophy. Each one of us is a star in the depth. We return to the bosom of the Father after having worked with the astral tinctures that transmute our seven bodies into vehicles of perfection. Just as the flames expand themselves, the seven ordaining beings, the seven planetary. Logoi of our solar system also expanded themselves in the dawn of life. The millions of divine particles evolving through the Mahamanvantara were the result of this expansion. Each divine particle must self-realize as a master of metallic transmutations and return to the Father. Every spark must return to the flame from which it departed, yet keeping its individuality. Chapter 61 of the Book of the Dead, of Coming Forth by Day, verse 17 states, Behold, the God of one face is with me. Hail, ye seven beings who make decrees, who support the scales on the night of the judgment of the Uchit, who cut off heads, who hack necks in pieces, who take possession of hearts by violence and rend the places where hearts are fixed, who make slaughtering in the lake of fire, I know you and I know your names, therefore know ye me even as I know your names. I come forth to you therefore come ye forth to me, for ye live in me and I would live in you. Make ye me to be. Vigorous by means of that which is in your hands, that is to say, by the rod of power, which is in your hands. Decree ye for my life by your speech year by year, give me multitudes of years over and above my years of life, and multitudes of months over and above my months of life, and multitudes of days over and above my days of life, and multitudes of nights over and above my nights of life, and grant that I may come forth and shine upon my statue, and me air for my nose, and let my eyes have the power to see among those divine beings who dwell in the horizon on the day when evil doing and wrong are justly assessed. The God of one face, which is within ourselves, is the innermost. The seven beings support the scale of judgment, and they decapitate and slaughter the alchemists in order to self-realize them as masters of metallic transmutations. Each time that one of our seven serpents rises from the vertebrae of the neck to the head, we pass through the symbolic slaughter. The seven planetary genii take possession of the hearts and tear the chests in order to liberate the souls of the underworld, to take them to the place of the light. The seven logoi perpetrate killings in the lake of fire. It is necessary to die in order to live. It is necessary to die to the world in order to live for the Father. We must die and resurrect as the phoenix bird of sexual alchemy in the magisterium of the fire. The immortal gods give us vigor with the staff of command that they hold in their dexterous hand. This staff is our spinal column, our bamboo reed with seven knots, through which the seven ardent serpents rise. We acquire the elixir of long life with the red and white elixirs, and although we are incarnated in our statue, that is to say, in our physical body, the internal worlds are open, and we can see the young, divine beings who dwell in the horizon and control the account books of the world. 
we return to the bosom of the Father and we hear ineffable words with the astral tinctures. All the power is found enclosed in the wisdom of the serpent. The Book of the Dead states the following. I am the serpent Sada, whose years are many. I die and I am born again each day. I am the serpent Sada which dwelleth in the uttermost parts of the earth. I die and I am born again and I renew myself and I grow young each day. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 87, of Making the Transformation into the Serpent Sada. The lunar tincture is of a violet color. The tincture of mercury is yellow. The tincture of Venus is indigo. The solar tincture is intense blue and golden. The tincture of Mars is red. The tincture of Jupiter is blue and purple. The tincture of Saturn is green, gray, and black. The alchemist must elaborate the seven tinctures in order to transmute all his metals. Chapter 12 The Two Witnesses And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rains not in the days of their prophesy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. Revelation, 11 verses 3 to 6, the two witnesses of the apocalypse, Revelation, are our two ganglionic cords through which the semen rises towards the chalice of our head. When the virile member is withdrawn from the vagina, without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm, the semen then rises through the two ganglionic cords to the chalice, the brain. These two ganglionic cords are known in the Orient as Ida and Pingla. Ida is the ganglionic cord of the right. Pingla is the ganglionic cord of the left. The semen rises to the head through these two nervous channels when we restrain the animal impulse. These are the two witnesses, the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. These are the two Ureus from the south and from the north that shine on the forehead. This is why the ancient kings had two crowns upon their heads and the sacred serpent upon the midbrow. The solar atoms of our seminal system rise through the right ganglionic channel. The lunar atoms of our seminal system rise through the left ganglionic channel. The right ganglionic cord is related with the left nasal cavity. The left ganglionic cord is related with the right nasal cavity. When the solar and lunar atoms of our seminal system make contact near the Triveni, which is in the chakra Muladhara, situated in the coccyx, the Kundalini then awakens and enters through the inferior orifice of the spinal medulla. The ascension of the Kundalini depends on the merits of the heart. The solar and lunar atoms of our seminal system make contact with the coccygeal bone when we learn to withdraw from our spouse without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm. In the temples of Lemuria, men and women entered sexual contact in order to reproduce the species, but none of them spilled the semen, reached the orgasm. The divine hierarchies utilized one sperm in order to fertilize the womb. One sperm easily escapes from the hormonal vessels. There is no need to fornicate to reproduce the species. Seminal ejaculation is an exclusive property of the animal species, but not of the human species. The human being must make his semen rise through the two ganglionic cords to the chalice, the brain. The black magicians were the ones who taught the human being how to ejaculate the semen like the animals. The black magicians of the opposite pole of the sanctuary of Vulcan taught the human being black sexual magic. This was their treason to the mysteries of Vulcan. The mysteries of sex are from the sanctuary of Vulcan. The guardians of that sanctuary committed the crime of betraying the mysteries when they allowed themselves to be seduced by those brothers of darkness. Black magicians ejaculate the semen during the acts of negative sexual magic. The serpent then descends towards the infernos of the human being. The tail with which Satan is represented is the condartiguator of black magicians. Such a tail is directed downwards towards the infernos of the human being. When the serpent ascends, it represents the bronze serpent, Kundalini, that healed the Israelites in the wilderness. 
And the Lord Jehovah said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Genesis 3 verse 14 When the serpent descends it signifies the tale of Satan, Kundartigwater. Such a tale is the tempting serpent of Eden, the horrible python serpent with seven heads that the enraged Apollo wounded with his darts. The serpent of fornication, Kundartigwater, is damned. We must reject the tempting serpent of Eden. Chapter 34 of Not Osiris Noah, Triumphant, Be Bitten by Snakes or worms, in the underworld. He saith, O serpent, I am the flame which shineth upon the opener of hundreds of thousands of years, and the standard of the god Tempu. Or, as others say, the standard of young plants and flowers. Depart ye from me, for I am the divine Maftet. We must reject the tempting serpent of Eden, and we must not spill the semen. Osiris Ani, triumphant, saith, I am the Great One, Son of the Great One, I am Fire, the Son of Fire, to whom was given his head after it had been cut off. The head of Osiris was not taken away from him, let not the head of Osiris Ani be taken away from him. I have knit myself together, I have made myself whole and complete. I have renewed my youth, I am Osiris, the Lord of Eternity. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 43 of not letting the head of a man be cut off from him in the underworld. The spark that dwells within ourselves is the daughter of the flame, the Great One, son of the Great One. After being slaughtered, the head is delivered to the Osiris of the Master. We pass through the slaughter of John the Baptist when the sacred serpent passes from the vertebrae of the neck to the head. No one cuts the head of the innermost, however, we must avoid falling into the abyss. We become complete and we become owners of eternity, filled with eternal youth, when we have raised our kundalini upon the staff, as Moses did in the desert. We must transform ourselves into divine crocodiles. The overseer of the house of the overseer of the seal, new, triumphant, saith, I am the divine crocodile which dwelleth in his tenor, I am the divine crocodile, and I seize my prey like a ravening beast. I am the great and mighty fish, which is in the city of Kemuar. I am the Lord to whom bowing in prostrations are made in the city of Sechem. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 88, of Making the Transformation into a Crocodile. This divine crocodile is the innermost. It is the divine crocodile that seizes its prey like a ravenous beast. These preys are the psychic extractions of all the vehicles of the innermost that he simulates in order to self-realize himself as a master of the Mahamanvantara. The innermost is the great and mighty fish that emerges from the waters of life in order to create the interior universe. He is the Lord who lives within ourselves and before whom we bow and prostrate. Noah, the overseer of the house of the overseer of the seal, triumphant, saith, Hail, thou serpent re-wreck, advance not hither. Behold Seb and Shu. Stand still now, and thou shalt eat the rat which is an abominable thing unto Ra and thou shalt crunch the bones of the filthy cat. The Book of the Dead, Chapter 33, of Repulsing Serpents The serpent re -wreck is the serpent of fornication that trembles before the living God and that crunches the bones of the filthy cat, by sinking it into the abyss of desperation. I am the divine crocodile Sebek. I am the flame of three wicks, and my wicks are immortal. I enter in the region of Sechem. I enter in the region of the flames that have defeated my adversaries. The Book of the Dead, the divine crocodile Sebek is the innermost. The innermost is the flame with three small wicks. These three wicks are the divine soul, the human soul, and the Christ mind. We enter Nirvana when we have defeated our adversaries, when we have defeated the tempting serpent of Eden, when we have defeated the four bodies of sin. It is necessary to not spill even a single drop of semen. It is necessary to make our seminal energy rise to our brain through the two ganglionic cords, in order to make the sacred serpent kundalini rise up the spinal medulla, through the 33 middolar vertebrae. Terrific powers exist within each one of the 33 vertebrae. As we enter each one of the 33 holy chambers, we learn divine wisdom. These are the seven loaves of bread brought as food to Horus. We must eat from these seven loaves of bread. 
We must not eat filthiness. We must not eat anything abominable. Anything filthy or abominable is known as fornication, adultery, hatred, selfishness, desire, envy, pseudo-spiritualist doctrines, etc. All of this is abominable food. All of this is filthiness. Let us eat from the seven loaves of bread. Let us be nourished with divine wisdom. We must make our seminal energy rise through the two witnesses. These are the two olive trees of the temple. These are the two candlesticks that are standing before the God of the earth. Chapter 13 The Chaos In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night and the evening, and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters that were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called the seas, and God saw that it was good. If a human being wishes to create his bodies of liberation, in order to self-realize as a master of the Mahamanvantra, he must then create as God did, by fecundating his seminal system in order for the interior universe to emerge from it. The chaos is the semen. If we wish to create as the gods, we must fecundate the chaos with the vivifying fire in order for our bodies of perfection, with which we realize ourselves as masters of the Mahamanvantra, to emerge from it. The chaos is a mixture of water and fire. The chaos holds the seeds of the cosmos. The water of the chaos is the receptacle of the fire. The earth is reduced to water, and the water is the receptacle of the fire. Our material body, which is our individual earth, is reduced to the water of the semen. Thus, if we fecundate the chaos of the semen with the fire of the spirit, the child of gold of sexual alchemy emerges. He is the intimate Christ who ascends to the Father and who makes us kings and queens, priests and priestesses of the universe. Genesis is a book of alchemy. Hence, if we wish to create our interior universe, we must create as God did when he created the universe. It is necessary to divide the waters from the waters in order to place these, the waters, above, in our divine heaven, firmament, where the glory of the innermost, spirit, shines. This is achieved by placing what is material and crude into the profundity of the abyss, and by raising our Christic force by sublimating our seminal energy. This is a work of sexual alchemy. This is why Hermes Trismegistus states, Separate that spirituous earth from the dense or crude by means of a gentle heat, with much attention. In great measure it ascends from the earth up to heaven, and descends again, newborn, on the earth, and the superior and the inferior are increased in power. The Emerald Tablet This is our blessed work of the great work. It is necessary to work over our chaos in order to separate the darkness from the light and to give to the darkness the abode of our God. We must make Genesis within ourselves. Hermes Trismegistus states, The superior agrees with the inferior, and the inferior with the superior, to effect that one truly wonderful work. The Emerald Tablet, the chaos of the universe resides here and now in our seminal system. If God had to fecundate the waters of the chaos with the fire in order to create the universe, we must do the same by fecundating the waters of our chaos, which is our semen, with the fire of the Kundalini. This is done in order to make our interior universe emerge and to convert ourselves into ineffable gods. This is known as sexual alchemy. The supercelestial waters of the chaos are pure semen, and from this semen the universe emerged. This supercelestial water of Genesis is a very pure, flexible, and inflamed substance, but it never consumes itself. This is the paradise where Adam lived before the downfall. Let us fecundate the chaos, semen. 
Let us divide the waters from the waters, by placing what is material and crude into the abyss and by placing the divine and sublime within our interior firmament. This is how we can convert ourselves into gods of the universe. Our seminal system, our earth, is now void and entirely without form. The darkness is now upon the face of the abyss and the spirit of God is moving upon the face of our seminal waters. Let us create light, brethren, let us create it by extracting the light from the darkness by means of sexual magic. The light is good, let us depart ourselves from the darkness. Let us divide the waters from the waters, in other words, the light from the darkness, and let us gather the tenebrous waters in the abyss in order to discover the dry matter, which is a rich interior universe, the bodies of perfection. Thus, we self-realize as masters of the interior and the delicate Eden, where the lights of the heaven shine and from where every living creature emerges. Let us perform Genesis within ourselves, by means of sexual alchemy. The book of Genesis is a treatise of sexual alchemy. The superior agrees with the inferior. The macrocosmic chaos is also in the microcosms. The waters of the chaos are in our sexual glands. These waters are the semen. If God had to fecundate the waters in order to create the universe, then we must do the same within ourselves. These waters are the semen of our sexual organs. So, we have then found the key of perpetual movement. Thus, when we will be gods, we will make majestic universes emerge from within. The terrific profundity of our superlative consciousness, by fecundating the semen with the fire. When the disciples and masters want to enter a new initiation, they must then ask to the logos of the solar system. However, when the master is liberated from the four bodies of sin, he does not need to ask to enter because he has entered the worlds of the gods and he is also a god. The master who has reached these heights knows that in order to enter a higher initiation he must fecundate his chaos in order to make new internal creations. This signifies new responsibilities before the karmic laws. We, the masters, are incessantly fecundating our chaos in order to create internal universes, each time more grandiose, each time more perfect. The more grandiose these internal universes are, the more karmic responsibilities the creators have. This is why we, the Buddhas, do not need to ask the Logos in order to enter new initiations. We, the Buddhas, now have a sufficient age in order to comprehend the solemn responsibility of any interior creation. The Logos, who is now capable of creating a solar system and crystallizing it with the Tattvas, has a very grave karmic responsibility immensely graver than that of the Arhat. A Logos creates when fecundating his own sexual seminal chaos. Therefore, we convert ourselves into ineffable gods, into solar Logos, into constellar Logos, etc., by fecundating our chaos. The Book of Genesis encloses the key of continuous movement. The Book of Genesis is a book of palpitating actualities. The Book of Genesis is a treatise of sexual alchemy. We have now found the key of perpetual movement, the elixir of long life, and the philosophical stone. We must now enter the world of the gods. There is the necessity to enter the kingdom of the superman. We must elevate ourselves to the superhuman kingdom. We must convert ourselves into hierarchs of the fire. Chapter 14 The Tatwas of Nature Tatva is vibration of the ether. The tattvas are the soul of the elements. The tattvas are the elements within ourselves. When the Logos fecundates the chaos, the tattvas enter into activity. The elements earth, water, air and fire exist in all the planes of the cosmic. Consciousness These elements in the internal worlds are known as tattvas. Alchemy is based on the chaos and on the tattvas. Akasa is the principle of the ether. Vayu is the principle of the air. Tejas is the principle of the fire. Apas is the principle of the water. Prithvi is the principle of the earth. The Anupataka and Adi Tattvas are completely spiritual. In the physical world, the Tattvas Akasa, Vayu, Tejas, Apas, and Prithvi are simply known as elements of nature. The most exact Tattvic timetable is the one of nature. Days with wind and hurricanes are influenced by Vayu. 
When the weather is very hot and sunny, the tap batagus is vibrating. Rainy days are influenced by oppas. Beautiful spring days are influenced by pritvi. Tedious and monotonous hours are influenced by akasa. The tattvas live in incessant alchemical transmutations. Alchemy is based on the chaos and on the tattvas. A master of metallic transmutations is also a master of the tattvas. What is a flash of lightning? A flash of lightning is transmuted earth. A flash of lightning is pritvi transmuted into tejas. The earth is transmuted into water the water into air, and the air into fire. Prithvi is transmuted into Appas, Appas evaporates into Vayu, and Vayu transforms itself into Tejas. All of these Tattvic transmutations are based on the chaos, in other words, on the semen of nature, on the Christonic substance of the solar logos. The Tattvic transmutations are the Kausa Kazorum of the transmutations of the elements of nature. If the earth is reduced to water, it is because Prithvi is reduced to Appas. This is a Tattvic transmutation. If the water converts itself into air and the air into fire, it is because Appas is transmuted into Vayu, and Vayu is transmuted into Tejas. Therefore, the souls of the elements live in incessant alchemical transmutations. This is why we see the earth being reduced into water, the water into air, and the air into fire. All these transmutations of the elements of nature are verified not only externally, but also internally in all the planes of the cosmic consciousness. This is verified not only in the planet Earth, but also in the planet human being. The tattvic transmutations are sexual alchemy. In the planet human being, we see how Prithvi is diminished into water, in other words, into semen, and we see this seminal chaos being transmuted into subtle steam. This steam of Vayu is at last transmuted into Tejas, in other words, into fire. The doctrine of the Tattvas is transcendental because the supreme keys of sexual magic are enclosed in it. The earth is converted into water by movement. This occurs when the water of the heating system of the interior of the earth penetrates through its conductors in the form of subtle steam. The earth, having the nature of salt, is then reduced to water. This water evaporates until it is converted into air by means of heat. Then, after a certain time of digestion, it is converted into thunder and flashes of lightning. In other words, into fire. This is how Prithvi, earth, is converted into Appas, water. This is how Appas is transformed into Vayu, air. This is how Vayu is transformed into Tejas, fire. All of these tattvic transmutations are performed by means of the chaos, Christonic semen. All of these tattvic transmutations are sexual alchemy. All of these tattvic transmutations are verified within our organic laboratory when we are practicing sexual magic. During sexual excitement, our earth, that is to say, our human organism, is reduced into water, in other words, semen. While in the state of erection, the viral member increases the amount of semen within the vessels of the sexual glands. This is how the sexual heat acts by transmuting our individual earth into pure water, into Christonic semen. This water, semen, is transmuted into the very subtle seminal vapors which ascend through our two ganglionic cords towards the chalice of the brain, when we restrain the sexual impulse. After some time of digestion, the solar and lunar currents of our seminal vapors make contact next to the Triveni, over the sacrum bone. This is in order for the sacred fire of Kundalini to sprout. This is how Prithvi is transmuted into Appas. This is how Appas is transmuted into Vayu. This is how Vayu is transmuted into Tejas. This is how we become masters of the Tattvas. When a Logos fecundates his chaos, he produces a series of tattvic transmutations, which crystallize in the end as the physical elements of nature. This is how the Logos can create solar systems and populate them with all types of beings. Hence, we also fecundate our chaos with the sacred fire of Kundalini during our trances of sexual magic. The outcome is a series of tattvic transmutations within our own organic laboratory, which culminate with the self-realization of the King's Son, the master of metallic transmutations within the living profundities of our interior consciousness. Chapter 15 
divine faux hat. The invisible stars that palpitate within the profundities of the infinite are ineffable flames. We are detached sparks from these eternal flames. Before the spark is unfastened from the flame, it is the very flame itself. We were those flames. We were those ineffable logoi, who in the dawn of life fecundated the chaos with our sacred fire, so that the seed plot of the cosmos could sprout from within the waters of life. These super-celestial waters are pure semen. Such waters are enclosed within our sexual glands. The air and the fire of these waters are the ineffable Eden, which resides within our own selves, inside the depths of our consciousness. The Holy Bible reveals to us about these waters in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. The book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 6 also reveals to us about these waters. Psalm 104 verse 3 narrates to us about the super-celestial waters from the universal chaos. This chaos is our Christonic semen. Such a flexible and malleable liquid is an inflamed substance, which constitutes the abode of the angels, seraphims, thrones, virtues, potencies, etc. This Christic substance is the chaos and life sprouts from within it. This chaos is Christ in substance, the liquid Christ who abides within our sexual glands. The super-celestial waters are co-penetrated by the super-celestial air and by the divine fire, where the divine gods of the unalterable infinite abide. If we spill those waters during the trance of sexual magic, then we also spill the super-celestial air and the divine fire which lives within those waters. This is how we sank into our own atomic infernos and into worlds of darkness, where nothing but the weeping and gnashing of teeth are heard. The fire and the air are superior elements. The fire in its absolute simplicity is the summum of all perfections. The air cannot achieve the penetration of the fire into its very essence, neither can it be fused with it because of being less pure. However, the air does it only when it has been purified in an absolute way. Elemental fire is concentrated within the luminaries of heaven. Those luminaries are the ineffable stars, the planetary logoi, who send their rays in order to help us in our cosmic evolution. The fire purifies all things by transmuting them into ineffable perfections. The fire acts in the center of each planet and within the heart of all life. The fire has its habitat within the water. Thus, if we spill the water, then we also spill the fire. Consequently, we remain in darkness. Sexual movement provokes emotion. Emotion puts respiration or air into motion. Then, the air insufflates life upon the fire when the solar and lunar atoms make contact in. The coccyx. This is how the kundalini is awakened and this is how we achieve fusion with the innermost. The fire cannot tolerate the crude water, but it must transmute it into subtle steam by means of heat. When the steam is transmuted into solar and lunar currents, the water is then sufficiently transmuted and purified in order to be eternally fused with the fire of the Kundalini. This work is sexual alchemy. The fire purifies the air, the air purifies the water, and the water purifies the earth with the continuous movement of the fire. This is how the elements, one with the other, are being purified. The water, or semen, acts upon the fire by confining it in our sexual organs in order to elevate it upwards through our spinal column. The fire works upon our four bodies of sin in order to elevate them towards their own degree of perfection. We extract the pure oil of the spirit from our four bodies of sin by means of the fire. This oil is lit when it is deprived of its impurities. Then, it burns as an ineffable flame. This is how it acts in the planet human being, by removing the unevenness of the elements and carrying all of them to perfection, in order to convert them into living fire. This is how the fire purifies the elements before assimilating them in a total manner. In nature, we see the earth reduced to water, the water transmuted into air, such as into clouds, and finally into fire, such as thunder and flashes of lightning. This fire of heaven provokes rain, and the rain gives life to the womb of the seeds in order for life to sprout. These repeated irrigations work on the seeds of the earth, where the fire of the strong and active life is enclosed. 
When the waters of heaven act upon the seeds in order to make the fire of life sprout from them, it is pure sexual alchemy. When the fire of Kundalini acts upon our seminal seeds it makes an interior atomic universe sprout from within our interior life. This universe is filled with ineffable perfections. This is how the planet human being, clean of impurities, consubstantiates himself with the fire of the spirit. Thus, he becomes an eternal flame. The ancient phoenix nourishes itself with the sacred fire within its rebel eagle's nest, and its fledglings pull off its eyes. This produces the immaculate whiteness of the ineffable spirit, who shines in the corners of the universe. This is how we transmute all of our metals into the pure gold of the spirit. This is the great arcanum. All the initiates who wanted to spread the great arcanum prior to me have died. In the Middle Ages, all the initiates who tried to divulge the great arcanum were killed. Some were killed by means of the shirts of Nessus, some were poisoned by perfumed bouquets, some died by the dagger, or by the scaffold. In the ancient Egypt of the pharaohs, those who intended to divulge the great arcanum were sentenced to the death penalty. Their head was cut off, their heart was torn out and their ashes were thrown into the four winds. There exists only one man in life who divulged the great arcanum and who did not die. I am that man, I am Samael on Veor.